Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I'm Michael. I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Well, uh, we were going to record yesterday, but yesterday was just one of those days, apparently, for both of us. <laughs> yeah, it was It was, It was. was a rough one, man. Yeah. Um, you uh, called me about quarter of seven from 45 minutes away. <laughs> yeah. And I said, just forget it. Because it had already been one of those days for me where, you know, like where as you're pulling up, every light in front of you turns red, like just as you're getting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Like, so you, then you know like, you know how to fix that cycle, right? Well, okay. So I always hate being the first person at a light because I feel like if I hadn't been fucking around at the last light, I would have made it through this. Well, light. exactly. Um, you, sometimes, usually, you have to run a couple of them, and then you'll hit a cycle where you're ahead of them again. Yeah, right. but that's I mean that's what I found at least. Well, and I lived in Atlanta for a long time. And the lights meant different thing. Yeah, things yeah. there than they do here. I mean, you yeah. know, it was like yellow meant. And I think yellow kind of means this more or less everywhere. It it's means, like, hurry up. If yeah. you're close, you can you make You better it. go. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but uh, red light in Atlanta meant, still, if you're close, go. Yeah. you can go ahead and go. And green light yeah. meant you got to wait for everybody that, clear, that ran the red light <laughs> to clear the, the intersection yeah. before so, you can go. So when the light turns green, you give it about five or six seconds at least before you go, right? Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I see, I don't feel that way here. And yeah. I, it really irritates me. Like, if you're the first person at a light, you have well. one job. <laughs> like your job is to watch that light for when it turns green. And when it turns green, you go. You go, yeah. You know, like I drive like a Guatemalan. Like as soon as that light turns green, it's like at the you're Grand going. Prix or something. I'm <laughs> slamming on it, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so if you're in front of me to light when it turns green, you better get going too. You better go too, yeah, all right. <laughs> but it did not work out that way yesterday. Uh, not, not not once. Not at all, yeah. <laughs> not once. Um, so, uh, you know, today we managed to get together. At a reasonable time. Yeah. Struggled with the audio software for five minutes or so before we got started. Not, still not quite sure what I did there. And I'll have to go hunt around somewhere to figure out how to restore the view the way I had it before. Um, but everything's working, so we can take that <clears throat> as a yeah, win, right? It does seem to be recording. <laughs> we hope. We'll find <laughs> out come the end of this, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, got the whiskey ready to go and uh we thought that we would start out although there's some interesting stuff going on in iran and i know at least one person that listens to the podcast was sending me texts yesterday about the the tanker the tanker stuff and uh so maybe if we have time at the end excuse me maybe if we have time at the end we can talk about that some um there's obviously still plenty of information unknown yeah but i was gonna say there's there's definitely more questions out there right now than answers when at least from what I've read, I mean, I haven't read anything that seemed solid yet. Are you kidding, man? P- Pompeo knows exactly what happened. <laughs> yes, of course he does. Within hours. Oh, Doesn't yes. even need an investigation. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's um, wartime. What you talking about? Yeah, it's <laughs> some vague intelligence stuff that he can't provide any information on. All right. <laughs> um, but what we thought we'd do is give you guys a little update on our uh, on our Second Amendment episode from... A few weeks back, uh, you know, could just some things have come up that seem worth talking about in that context. We should take some time on, yeah. So, to start with, the um, the Stoneman Douglas High School resource officer, the coward of Broward, I don't even remember his real name. Um, <laughs> no, I don't know him, no one either. Uh, he was arrested last last week, week and a half ago about, actually, yeah. I guess. Um, and... He's facing up to 96 years for criminal negligence uh, yeah. in relation to to his inaction uh, yeah. at the high school. Um, for those who don't remember or somehow somehow missed this, I've encountered people who have yeah. not that didn't know anything about this. So might as well give a little background. I mean, but I figure they all at least know who David Hogg is, right? <laughs> well, I don't know. I've definitely encountered some people <laughs> yeah. that. So. Anyway, um, so there was the, the shooting at uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Uh, was it last it was, year or the year before? Over, it was over a year ago. Okay. I think they had the year anniversary not that long ago. Okay. I so could be wrong, but I'm thinking that's correct. It wasn't the school year that just ended. It was the previous school yes, year. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And um, 
think it's like 17 kids were killed and, mm-hmm. and another 17 were uh, were injured yep. um, when uh, this kid Cruz went in there and fired away. Yeah. And this particular guy, he's the school's resource officer, so it is his job to be there and be be the person at the school with the gun. He's the good guy with the gun. Right. And uh, so when the shooting started, um, instead of going in, he went and hid. Okay. Well, waited for backup. Yeah. <laughs> I think sure. that was that was his claim, at least, when he was confronted with it. Honestly, that's not an unreasonable claim. Well, you don't. Okay. Okay. So anyway, the the background here is that this resource officer, it's his job to be the person on scene to take care of any violence or problems that come up. And uh, he didn't. Yeah. Um, And, you know, 17 kids were killed and another 17 were injured. And he's being held uh, criminally liable for negligence um, and one count of perjury. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, The count of perjury is he... Uh, he gave a sworn statement to the investigation after all this happened. Yeah. Uh, so perjury could mean he misremembered something or misstated something. Do, do we actually know? Because maybe, it, I mean, because I don't know what the perjury is is about, but it could also be that he claimed he did something he didn't do. That video evidence showed that he was he said he was in one place and in reality he was in another. That's certainly possible. I, I hunted around. Because I don't to, know. Yeah, yeah, I hunted around to try and find what the perjury yeah. was about and I, I couldn't. You couldn't find, yeah. yeah it I may not find. be public yet. So. Yeah. Um so here's the question though. Um it is the does he have a a legal obligation? Is this case going anywhere? Um, well, a few different directions you can go on that. Um, the truth I is, I think your feelings are different than mine. My feelings so. are different than you. I, I would agree. And in, if we're going to talk reality, I don't think the case is going to go anywhere. I think there's enough pres- precedent out there um, that there's just that that the gu- the the police don't have a duty to protect you. And I think at the end of the day, that's going to end up saving this guy. Now, I. I personally believe that, yeah, he should absolutely be held liable for this. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, that's just, you're the guy that's being paid to be there to be the guy with the gun. Be the guy with the gun. I mean, you, you know, I, that's just the way. And I, yeah, I just, that's how I feel about that. I mean. Well, I, I think in a lot of ways, it, it's not like he's a, I mean, he's technically a police officer. Like, Yeah. He, Oh, he's but, absolutely a police officer. But he's not. No, he's not really. Well, how do you I mean? I would say. I mean, I, I don't think that the expectation of um, interaction with criminals is the same when you take on the job as a school resource officer at a middle class no. high school as it is if you're going and, and working for the police department as a street policeman. I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, the the, the expectation should be the same. I mean, if you're going to wear the uniform, wear the uniform. Yeah. I, I mean, now maybe you're not in there cracking skulls every day, obviously, because it's a bunch of teenagers. But you should be prepared every day for every, anything that can happen. I think that it's actually, in terms of expectations for the person, it is not dissimilar from going and being a mall cop. I yeah. think that your expectation is you're going to break up some teens in public displays of affection or you're going to make some kids dump out their bag of weed on the lawn yeah. or what have you. I think the idea of facing down a, a maniac with a with a rifle is not really yeah. entering into your ideas of what's going to happen in this in this job. I'm not but, saying that it shouldn't necessarily, but I think that it probably doesn't. I'm I'm well I would I would grant you that it probably doesn't, but it absolutely should mm-hmm. because at the end of the day that's why he's there. Any teacher can do any of the things you just listed. The things that the teacher can't do is be the person there to protect the kids with the gun. Yeah. Now, and I believe they should be, have the right to do that too. Yeah. I believe if a teacher chooses to conceal carry in a school, they should have that right. Yeah. Now, I do believe it, it should have to be conceal carry, mm-hmm. and there shouldn't shouldn't anybody really know who's carrying and who's not. Um, I don't think that it should be 
like public knowledge that you know XYZ yeah. has guns. Yeah. But I I think that if a teacher wants to wants to carry, they ought to be able to. Well, I, I want to address that point because this is a question that came up when I was running for board of education. Yeah. Um, the people asked me. Not a lot, surprisingly, <laughs> yeah. with all that was going on, but yeah. uh, because this was about that time. This was actually. during that time period. Yeah. Um, but this is a question that came up to me: like, what did I, what did I think that they needed to do to protect the schools? Yeah. Honestly, my first answer was teach kids differently. I, I think that there's a a problem with, um, with teaching kids how to cope. What? With issues generally, yeah. uh, I think that you know, you teach kids better coping mechanisms. That would <laughs> go a long take way. care of a lot of this. Um, yeah. Obviously, there's um, the issue with the with the drugs, the antidepressants, and so forth that they're giving these kids. Certainly, yeah. there's some kind of relation there, although they don't really talk about yeah, it. Yeah, you're not going to um, hear that. But on the every, all media. of these shooters have been on uh, what are the SSRIs or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I, I, to me, the answer is. Uh, to allow teachers that choose to yeah. and are licensed in this state. I mean, yeah. you know, you have to which pay attention. To, I mean, that's doesn't question. Take, which doesn't, well, what I was going to say is doesn't take much in oh, the yeah. state. I yeah. mean, you basically, you ask, you receive. Yeah, this is, this is Alabama. You literally yeah. walk in there the first time you're getting licensed to, for a concealed carry, and the big step is to get your picture taken. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so you go in, you get your picture taken, you give them your money, you walk out with a license. That's yeah, that's, that's the end of that, it. That that is the process. <laughs> yeah. And I'm fine with that. I am too. So. Um but the you know, again, the teachers that choose to conceal carry and yeah. have the license to do so can. Yeah. I, They're not, I agree. I d I don't want I don't want to force them to or ask them to. No. I don't and I don't want to tell them that they can't. I yeah. want to give them that choice. And then then there is exactly that question. You don't yeah. know who may or may not have a gun. Yep. Exactly. And that that in itself makes it safer. Be- becomes a deterrent. Yeah. Absolutely. Like People don't walk in to start shooting around places where they know people are carrying guns. Yep. That Those yeah. end really quickly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, in this particular case with this guy, I, I think the prosecution is, I mean, he's facing up to up to a hundred, uh, well, 96 or 97 years yeah. um, for these offenses if he were convicted with the maximums on all of them. Yeah. Um, I think that this is just a response to public pressure. They want to make a show of doing something about this because people were outraged about how he acted. Yeah. Um, legally, I don't think that there's anything there. I think that he has a moral responsibility to protect those kids. He took oh. this job. Um, I think he has an ethical responsibility to protect those kids. Again, he took this job. Yeah. But I don't think that he has a legal responsibility to protect these kids. And the other thing about this is that you... Th- this is kind of the the libertarian point that I would make about this yeah. is that you can't hold somebody criminally liable for not doing something Yeah. for not putting himself in harm's way. I just, and you can never know what impact it would have had anyway. No, I agree with that. I, I do agree with that. He might've walked in that door and been immediately shot and it would have been, wouldn't have wouldn't been, been any been different yeah. or just one more body. Yeah. But <clears throat> at the same time, I think you have a contractual obligation to have done something because you're being paid to be the person to be there and and he wasn't Mm -hmm. i mean i i I do think so i i kind of feel like maybe criminal charges aren't aren't shouldn't be on the table but Mm -hmm. i absolutely think that that like maybe civil charges um but it, it but then again you can't reimburse somebody for their loss well and you can't prove that his any action that he would have taken would have prevented the loss anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, is <laughs> you, you have to also take it from his perspective a little bit. Um, and you have to think that he didn't know what was going on. Yeah. He didn't know how many people there were with guns in their shooting. It's true. Um, I mean, it, this is really easy when we're sitting back here and we know there was one guy with a gun. Yeah. Um, but he could have gone in there thinking there was one guy with a gun and, and gotten shot in the back three. of the head by the other guy. Yeah, uh, it's true. And so <laughs> I, I think that it's pretty despicable what he did, but I don't think that you can hold him liable. I think that yeah. the answer to this is what you would get out of breaking. And now you can maybe 
maybe pursue it under contract law, but I don't know what his contract says. I doubt it yeah. says that you have to put yourself in mortal danger. Yeah. Um, well, but I mean, as being a police officer, that's what they do every day. Yeah, but I he's mean, not really a police officer. I mean, he's, yeah. again, like, technically he is. Yeah. But it's not the same as a guy out there in a patrol car. Yeah. It, it's it's not the same. Yeah. And um, I, I think that the answer to this really is that that he should be obviously fired. Yeah. Lose any pensions or benefits. Yeah. Um, I think that that's the best you can do. I think I that the the and department that hires him has to handle it internally. I don't think that you can handle it through the legal system in that way. Yeah. And I can almost get by with that, but it's just so hard for me to to accept that because just when you look at the consequences. I just, I, I, I do. I still have mm-hmm. a hard, because, I mean, I don't think you're necessarily wrong. Mm-hmm. I just, I have a hard time swallowing it. No, I get it. And I, like I said, I mean, it, okay, so if my kid had been there, yeah. I would probably be out there with a lynch mob to string him up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, damn the consequences. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think that from an objective standpoint. Yeah. Well, an illegal, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, what, what. What actually can you can you do? You yeah. Know? Well, and even if, even if you take away the legal aspect of it, I just think from an objective, principled standpoint, yeah. you can't punish somebody for for not doing something. Yeah. yeah. And, and especially when that not doing something is not doing something that would potentially put their own life in danger. Yeah. I just feel like you're you're still under some kind of obligation to act in mm-hmm. that scenario, especially when you're him. Mm-hmm. Now, if he had been, if we were talking about a citizen, mm-hmm. I think that was just like happened to be in the area at the time, I would feel a little differently because. Yeah. But when you when you ha- have the position of police officer, protect and serve, mm-hmm. like there's a higher standard there. Yeah. Well, and the the other thing though is that you never know how you're going to react in that situation. It's true. In that situation, it's absolutely. I mean, he may have been really certain that he would be able to do his duty when the bullets started flying, and then when they actually did, he wasn't. Yeah, he couldn't. Uh, I mean, think about how hard the military works to weed out those people before they send them into combat, and they still run into this problem. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, But I I definitely agree with that because you don't know how you're going to react. And I mean, I mean, you don't know if you're a fighter or a flyer till you, (laughs) you know, till the bullets start flying. Yeah. (laughs) So. Um. So. That that kind of uh, this is a poor segue, but um, I actually wanted to move this into the issue with uh, Ronald Stolarchik. Yeah, I think I'm saying that name right. <laughs> you know, anyway, Who knows? Uh, Slavic names. Um, Ronald Stolarchik was in Deerfield, New York. Yeah, and uh, he. Uh, so the background on this, and I hadn't seen this get a lot of press. I mean, I went hunting for it when I heard about I it. I haven't seen this get any press. You brought it up to me the other day, and I done some digging and yeah. found things, but <laughs> none of this appeared to me organically yeah I, most of what i found was local syracuse yeah. Yeah. uh newspaper stuff uh or online news mm-hmm. um and there wasn't a lot of information i i had i came across one article that had a fair bit of information that's sitting on the table right here <laughs> yeah um but it's really it's not a large article by no the way. it's a, it's a short <laughs> article i mean it's in big print and it's like a page yeah <laughs> with pictures with pictures yeah. <laughs> yeah um but essentially from what I can tell, what happened was uh, there was this old older gentleman, Ronald Stolarchik, um, who lived out by himself, and he was kind of a hoarder. And so his his house was kind of broken down, and I guess he didn't have electricity and yeah. um, and so forth. And uh, these two people, one of whom had apparently been there before, but we'll get back to that. Yeah. Um, these two people, the immediate issue is that these two people broke into that house, and um, and he was there. And they broke into the house to to rob the house. Yeah. Uh, and um, he yelled down to them from upstairs to leave. And instead of leaving, they came towards him, and he shot them both. Yeah. Um. So and he shot them both dead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So he he shot them both in, in the chest. Yeah. And one of them was dead on arrival, and the other one um, was dead when he arrived at the hospital. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, he, he killed both the robbers, 
the police at this point are saying that it was a legal shoot in terms of that he had a reasonable, from what they know. Yeah. I mean, obviously, at the they're time wait, that they wrote this, they're waiting the, on autopsy stuff. Yeah, and if they find that he shot him four times in the back or whatever, that yeah. changes the situation. But based on what they I guess know it does, yeah. and what they could see on the scene, and I mean... Yeah. Truthfully, if he if he had shot him in the back, the exit wounds I think would show that. Yeah. Pretty. Dis- yeah. I mean, you gotta wait for the the legit forensics, but absolutely. But uh, hopefully, any police officer, any with officer assault, with yeah, yeah, anybody other than the Broward coward <laughs> ought to be able to <laughs> yeah. figure out, you know, based on looking at the bodies, how yeah. they were shot. Exactly. Um, but anyway, so based on the information available at the time. It looked like a legal shoot. They have yeah. castle law, so yeah. um, inside his house, it was legal for him to shoot them. Yeah. All right. Um, but he was arrested. And he was arrested for shooting them with a gun that he had not legally registered with the state. Which, just to say, is so he's absolute arrested on, insanity. Yeah, he's arrested on a bureaucratic crime. Yeah. Um, and it's and, a felony. Yeah. And the interesting thing I found was that it was a hand-me-down pistol from his father. Yeah. So his his father died. He took the gun, and he just never registered it with the state of New York under his possession. Yeah. And that's what happened. And so even in his own house... He can't use a gun that he's in, technically in possession with. Yeah. Uh, that he hadn't registered. That he hadn't registered. Mm-hmm. Which, the whole idea that you would have that you would inherit a gun and then have to go... Uh, register it is insanity to me. Yeah, I mean it. It. I mean that's that is insanity. They did expressly say that the gun had been purchased legally by his father. Yeah, so it wasn't like this was a street gun or anything. No, it was it was a gun that was that his father legally possessed. He left it to his son, and then this happened. Yeah, and now he's facing a lot of time, from what I understand. Yeah, well, felony charges. And, yeah. Um, and we'll see what happens when they come up with the autopsy. I suspect that he's yeah. telling the truth. Here's the other bit that I was saying. Uh, one of those people had apparently been there before because when they were investigating this after the fact, yeah. um, they found a bunch of Mr. Stolarchik's possessions in the apartment of one of the people that he <laughs> shot the yeah. second time. So the, the person had been there before and robbed from him before. Four. Yeah, yeah. They were just and then, back again. And then yeah. brought his aunt or something back with him to rob <laughs> some more. Wow. <laughs> yeah. um, so all of this actually kind of combines together into one particular point. Now, in this case, it was a uh, it was a you know a bureaucratic crime that they're charging Stolarchik with, but they're yeah. still charging him with a crime for defending his property, essentially. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and so it, it still represents the point. And there's certainly pushes for more and more uh, firearms control all over. Oh yeah, uh, you know common sense. Common sense gun reform, but right. and I would just like to note that what he's being charged with would fall under common sense gun reform. I mean, this is the this is the type of laws you would get out of that. Is mm-hmm. well, we need to know who has guns and who doesn't. Right. So, in a situation where someone, this would be a situation where somebody had a gun they didn't know about, mm-hmm. and he's being punished for it. Right. So, I mean, that that falls in that category. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, here, there's the old joke, right, which I'm, you've probably heard, uh, which is the reason I carry a gun is because I can't carry a cop. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, and, you know, 911 response times in this country are not great. The average is like 10 minutes. Yeah. And in, you know, poorer areas, it can get up to like, 30 to 40 minutes. Well, I don't know where this guy was at, but it looks like he's in a pretty rural area. Yeah. Um, just yeah, from the pictures I've seen. Now, yeah, I don't know. Seems like it was I don't know the nowhere. area at all, but yeah. I mean, it, it looks pretty rural. Well, and they condemned his house afterwards, too. Which I thought was insane. Yeah. When I read that, I was <laughs> like... cruelty. It's more punishment. I right? mean, it's just more punishment. I mean, this guy <laughs> didn't do anything to bring any of this upon himself. They broke into his house... He took care of that situation, and now not only is he facing gun charges, but he's also been condemned out of his own house. Yeah. Well, he made the house look abandoned, so they thought that they could just go take what they wanted. <laughs> is that is that your defense? <laughs> Maybe. I, there was something in the uh, the stuff that I read about how yeah. the the house looked abandoned, like yeah. they were already providing this excuse for the people for that, the people were, yeah. that were robbing him. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter if it's abandoned or not. You don't have a right to it. Yeah. Exactly. It's not your. Yeah, it's not exactly. your stuff anyway. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, you can maybe claim salvage. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, I think so there's still a process. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I, I started digging deeper and going, you know, referring back to the, the coward of Broward and, and saying that there's no legal obligation. There's a, yeah. There's a lot of court precedent about how police don't have any kind of duty to to protect you yeah um and so like it goes way back to like the 1930s uh these court cases that where they said that they don't they don't have any responsibility to you essentially yeah um the the crux of it essentially is that the um Police have a responsibility to protect the community as a whole, but not any individual. Yeah. Okay. Explain how that one works. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and essentially, it's to protect them from being sued for not having enough coverage to handle everything, yeah. or you know, to prevent frivolous lawsuits about a crime happened at my house and the the police weren't there. Yeah. I mean, because obviously the police can't be any. They can't be everywhere. And um, I and while I understand that that train of thought. It, when you end up with specific instances of negligence on their part, I think they should be held accountable for that. Yeah. Well, because I, uh, I, there were a couple of cases that I wanted to discuss. Um, one of them was more recent, and it was um, and it was used in the opinion for the the bigger, like more important case, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And this was uh, DeShaney versus Winnebago County Department of Social Services, 1989. All right. Um, the, and, and they're talking about the constitutional duties of care and protection. I think that's an important point. Yeah. Because, like, the police aren't part of the Constitution. Yeah. Right? They're, the sh- the uh, sheriff is. This is a local government. Right. Or this is, yeah, yeah. Right? County sheriffs are. I'm pretty sure they are. But I, I, although I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's the only law enforcement position that's expressly that laid out. Called out. Yeah, but yeah. at any rate, um, essentially what they said in this particular case is that uh, the um, police only have a duty to protect when they've created a special relationship between them and the person that either was or wasn't protected Yeah. Um, in this case. And the way they set a special relationship is by putting them in a position where they can't defend themselves. Essentially, so uh, examples they gave were um, prisoners in custody, yeah. um, the uh, involuntary mental patients, like if you were committed involuntarily, um, and people restrained without consent, which I thought was a funny <laughs> phrase in there. Like, because who consents to that, right? Well, I mean, <laughs> there is that. <laughs> there are people, but usually not with the police. Yeah. Well. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> Point um, taken. <laughs> yeah. So essentially, if they if they placed you in a position where you couldn't protect yourself, then they had created a special relationship and they had a duty to, to protect, protect you. you. Okay. Um, another uh, example of that was um, uh, that if they put like an informant in a position where they were to make a deal with somebody that they were going to arrest, like if you if they Police put you through affirmative action in harm's way. Yeah. So they said, okay, thanks for that information. All right, what we want you to do is go make a deal with this guy. And, you know, we'll be there to watch the deal go down so that we can arrest him. Well, in that case, you've you've in- they have intentionally an obligation. Yeah. put this person potentially in harm's way, and they have a duty to protect that person. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. Um, but the the I think the really important case, the one that people should understand, yeah. know that this is out there. Okay. Because I, I think that most people think that the police do have some kind of responsibility to you. Yeah. At the very least, if you call them. Well, yeah. Uh, you know. And and I do think that that most people believe that, but you'd be surprised. Yes, and you're about to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the big one was uh, Warren versus District of Columbia. This is 1981. Um, and they ruled that the the police had no constitutional duty to correct uh, to protect. And he, here's what happened: um, there were uh, three women and a child living in a like a boarding house. Yeah. All right. And so there was a woman and her daughter on the second floor, and two more women living on the third floor. Yeah. And they were woken up in the middle of the night with glass shattering from somebody breaking in. Um, and they these assailants, these two guys. Uh, went in on the second floor and um, said the two women on the third floor started hearing the woman on the second floor screaming. Yeah. And so uh, they climbed out 
the their window onto the roof and then got onto an adjacent roof and called the police. Yeah. And said that there was a robbery going on and yeah. that they needed help. And the dispatch officer told them help will be on the way. Yeah. And they they dispatched the call, but they dispatched it as a code two. Crimes in progress are supposed to be dispatched as code one. So they, they sent it out at a lower priority than it should have been. Yeah. Um, and they sent three cars uh, to the location. And the women said that they saw one car drive across the back of the house. Um, the car didn't stop. Uh, the guy didn't get out, hang out the window, anything. Nothing. Just right? drive by. The police drove by the back, didn't see anything, kept going. Yeah. Um, apparently, one of the policemen stopped at the front of the house, went up and knocked on the front door, didn't get an answer, and so he left. <laughs> and that was the wow. end of it. Yeah. So they, they see the police leaving, and they think, well, they must have taken care of this problem. So they climb back into the house, and they still hear the woman on the second floor screaming. Yeah. So they go back out onto the roof again, onto the adjoining roof, yeah. and they call the police again and say, hey, this is still going on. We still need help. Yeah. And so the dispatcher says, well, we'll have help on the way. Yeah. And they didn't even dispatch it the second time. Oh, wow. They didn't even send it out to anyone. What? <laughs> right. And um, to make a long, horrible story short, uh, they go back in after a time thinking that the, the situation must have been handled. Yeah. And the two robbers are still in the house. And the two robbers end up taking all of the women um, back to one of their apartments and uh, and rape and beat and you know force them to uh, you know into sexual acts with each other and so on like really terrible thing for like fourteen hours. Wow. Right. Wow. And so um, so these women sued the District of Columbia police for not doing their duty essentially rightly so i mean uh, i don't know how you could again you know this negligence thing right yeah so they threw out the case really yeah so they appealed it yeah and the appeal the result of the appeal was that it was right to throw out the case because they have no duty to any particular citizen yeah um unless they've created a special relationship and they made it quite clear that asking for help does not create that special relationship. Yeah, that's insane. Right. Insane. Um, and then this was followed up with another, uh, with another case later on, which is Henderson versus the city of St. Petersburg, um, where a guy uh, called the police and because he was having to do like a money drop, like you have to do for yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so he's doing a money drop, and it's like a. a kind of a seedy area in an alley with not a lot of light and he'd been robbed there before yeah. and so he called the police and told them that he was doing this and they um and that he needed protection while he was doing his job yeah and um the police agreed and they even set up like a plan as to how he would do it yeah with their protection yeah and he followed the plan but the police weren't there <laughs> and he was shot Oh, wow. So he's robbed again and shot. Robbed and shot. Yeah. Right. And um, and so he, he sued them too, and they threw out the case again. And they said that even <laughs> a, a request for aid, even with the promise of protection from the police, isn't, does not constitute enough. a special not. relationship. Wow. Wow. To provide protection. So those of you that think that it's okay if they... If they abolish the Second Amendment, take away your guns, et cetera, think that the, it's the state's responsibility to protect you. Uh, even think um, of the riots a couple of years ago uh, out in California yeah. where the police were just standing back and allowing the destruction of property. Just happen. Um, yeah. And when asked about it, the chief of police said, well, we didn't want to put our guys in there because we were afraid that the violence would be turned towards the police officers. <laughs> and the rest of us, like at least some of us, were yelling, well, that's their job. That's that what they signed up for. That is kind of why they're there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well... Apparently not. Apparently not. Wow. Yeah. So um, if you can't protect yourself and you can't rely on the state to protect you, where are you? Yeah, exactly. I Hence mean, the importance of the Second Amendment. That's why we have the Second Amendment. Well, Absolutely. not really. But well, it's to it's, protect us it's, from the state, <laughs> technically. But yeah. But it's a big part of it, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's, you know. Yeah. Uh, the important the important point here from a libertarian perspective, from a natural rights perspective, yeah. is that you have the if you have the right to life yeah. an essential corollary of the right to life is the right to protect it yep absolutely and through the best means you see possible yep 
So, um, so yeah, I guess that wraps up that point. Don't <laughs> don't think that you can depend on the police. Yeah, that's, that's, they don't have to help you. They they don't have that duty. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the other thing uh, that I want to talk about, I'm trying to check the time here. Yeah, how I can't far see that far. About, about 30 some minutes. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is that the, the Women's World Cup is going on. FIFA World Cup. Woo! Yeah. Um, I, I love women. soccer, man. I, <laughs> and the USA team, the, the women are good. Oh, yeah? The men's team can't even qualify for the World Cup, but the women oh, wow. are good. Um, in fact, they're the defending champions, I believe. Uh, but anyway... Um, because the Women's World Cup is here, there's a whole bunch of complaint about gender pay gap, specifically yeah. with the World Cup. Because the men's um, World Cup champions and the, the people that, that get paid out get paid out far more than the women do. And yeah. it's gender discrimination. Gender discrimination. Gender discrimination. <laughs> is it though? And I'm here to make the case that it is not. <laughs> This is market forces at work. Yeah. Um, so in the World Cup specifically, I spent a bunch of time digging into statistics. So I hope you guys are ready for some numbers. <laughs> let's you, hear some. Let's been, hear some numbers, Mike. <laughs> you've been getting court cases so far. Now you're getting. Now you're getting monetary statistics. Right? All right. Um, so it, what first struck me was that they the uh, it's being held in France. Yeah. Um, the 2019 World Cup. It's being held in France, okay. and the opening match between France and South Africa, I want to say. Maybe it was South Korea. South something. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the opening match, they were excited. They'd sold out 45,000 tickets. Okay. Um, for the home team, home national team. So this is their home field? Yeah. It was in Paris. Okay. All yeah. Right. yeah um, that's so, home team. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So the, the French team in Paris, yeah. the French national team in Paris at the biggest women's soccer tournament that there is. Yeah. All right. They sold out 45,000. Okay. Um, so we live here in Alabama. In Tuscaloosa, the University of Alabama football team, the, the college football team, the one of the college football teams <laughs> yeah, in Alabama. We, we have more than one. Consistently, yeah. like really every weekend as far as I know, yeah. sells out their stadium. I can't remember the name of the stadium, but yeah. it has 100,000 seats. Yeah. Sold out. Every Every week. weekend. Every week. Even doesn't when they know they're going to win 100 and nothing. I was going to say, it doesn't matter who we're playing. <laughs> yeah. Don't matter. We're coming to see them. 100,000 people every weekend. So, and that's that's just a college football team. Yeah. There's, what, 300 Division One college football teams oh, in the something country? Something like, something like that. that. Yeah, it's a bunch. Um, And theirs isn't even the biggest stadium. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's some places out in, uh, like, out in the Rose Bowl's bigger, I think. I, I don't remember. Yeah. Anyway, there's there's a bunch of there's some stadiums, stadiums that are bigger that yeah. also sell out, at least sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, so we're talking about 100, 120,000 people for for high-level Division One college <laughs> football yeah. in the States. And they sold out 45,000 tickets to their national team at the biggest tournament. Yay. Good job, guys. Girls. <laughs> Girls, my bad. <laughs> yeah. um, so, what I'm going to say is that this is the reason that they're paid less is market forces. Yeah. And um, so here's the here's the statistics. I'm going to hit you with a bunch at once, and we can discuss them in right. more detail. Um, so the men's World Cup, 2018 men's World Cup in Russia. Yeah. Um, in less than two months, five months before the tournament, something like that. Yeah. Uh, between. The beginning of December and the end of January, uh, they opened up the random selection draw for the group stage tickets, ticket yeah. requests. And essentially what that is is that you put you submit a list of tickets that you would like that you would like to have, and then they randomly draw you get somewhere between sure. all and none of those that you request. Interesting. Um, so in that time period, in that less than two months, they had over four million ticket requests Ooh. for the random selection draw. <laughs> All right, um, they sold more than three million. Uh, I mean, there were more than th- there were, the total attendance was more than three million people. Yeah. Um, they averaged forty seven thousand people per match. Wow. Um, <clears throat> now for the twenty nineteen women's World Cup, they have one point three million total tickets available, and at the beginning of the week, 
they had sold 960,000 of them. The tournament's already begun, oh, remember. Yeah. Okay. So the tournament's already begun, and of yeah. the 1.3 million tickets they have available, they have sold 960,000 of those. They have not sold all of them. They have not sold all of them. The total attendance, again, for the men's was 3 million. Yeah, <laughs> right. And they did not have trouble selling those tickets. Yeah. And I'm assuming, yeah, if they're doing like a lottery-type deal, they're selling all of them. Yeah. Um. The 2018 Men's World Cup generated six b- b- billion dollars. What in total revenue? Wow! Now we don't have numbers no. for the women's 2019 World Cup yet. Obviously, fair enough. Um, but the 20. So I, I did some extrapolation. Okay. Right. So the the Men's World Cup, the revenue was up about 25 percent from the previous World Cup in 2014. Yeah. Um, the 2015 Women's World Cup generated 73 million dollars in total. 73 million dollars in total revenue. Yes. The men's <laughs> generated. Wait, 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 wait. wait. You got to run that by me again. <laughs> okay. The 2018. Well, let me tell you where I went with that. I had okay. a 25 percent. It's a little over 90 million. So we'll. Okay. We'll, be and they're estimating a hundred and something, so we'll just say a hundred million. Okay. So the the men's World Cup last year generated six billion dollars in revenue, <laughs> and the women's World Cup this year is expected to generate about a hundred million. <laughs> really? Yeah. So, so there's a gap here. About one and a half percent of what the men. Yeah. <laughs> the men did. Um. And, but wait, there's more. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. So uh, ticket prices were crazy, right? So yeah. at the Men's World Cup, the cheapest ticket um, for the group stage yeah. was $105. And the most expensive ticket at the, in the final was $1,100. Really? All right. For the, for the women's, the cheapest ticket for the group stage is $10. Wow. <laughs> And the most expensive ticket for the final is $95. So the really? most expensive women's ticket for the final yeah. is less than the cheapest men's ticket for the group stage. Well, I see what the problem is. They're not charging They're enough. They're not charging enough. Right. They're not charging enough. Because they haven't even sold out <laughs> right. at the prices that they've got. Oh, wow. So we're seeing maybe... Maybe what the issue is. So, here, right? so, so maybe the issue is not that the guys are making more, but maybe they're. I don't know. Like, there, there's definitely some some issues here with revenue. Like, yeah, <laughs> there's an interest problem. That yeah. they they just don't generate as much interest. Yeah. Um, and frankly, if we're talking about women's sports, I think that soccer is one of those that there's there's the least difference between the men and the women. Yeah, um, and as far as like in game, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I enjoy women's soccer. I th- yeah. I think it's fun. I mean, I, you know, it's not it's not quite as fast, yeah, um, as the men's game, but yeah, uh, it's still. I mean, I, I it's think entertaining. It, yeah, I, I yeah. think it's it, I think it's, it's comparable so it's in a not, lot of ways. So it's not like women's basketball. No, <laughs> no, no, exactly. <laughs> right when the WNBA started. I was a huge basketball fan. Yeah. Um, I watched as much basketball as I could. And I was excited when they started the WNBA because I was like, yeah. all right, well, now I get basketball all summer, too. Nice. Yeah. Um, and I, I watched like a dozen games. Yeah. Couldn't and I was get like, through. man, this is boring. <laughs> this is so boring. It's slow. It's sloppy. It's just not. But the fundamentals, man. They yeah, have yeah. the fundamentals. <laughs> is that uh, Futurama episode? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can't dunk, but they've got better fundamentals. Yes. Right. Well, I don't care about dunking that much. It was just not. It's just not that. It's entertaining. just not entertaining. And I'm. I'm yeah. pretty sure. I'm not 100 percent on this, but I'm pretty sure that the NBA uh, D leagues, the developmental leagues, yeah, um, get better attendance than the WNBA. Really? Yeah. Um, so you're not alone in this. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't seem so. So, but here's the big complaint, right? So the the men's champion. Um, received thirty eight million dollars in prizes. Okay. Um, the women's champion will will receive three point eight million dollars in, in prizes. So, just seems ten like, percent of what the yeah, guys got. Yeah. Um, but look at what the men bring in. Well, and and that's really the point, right? So uh, the the total prize pool for the men is four hundred million dollars, and the total prize pool for the women is thirty million dollars. Yeah. Less than ten percent. Yeah. But Doing some quick math on the revenue and the prize pools. Yeah. This is what you... The men... 
Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, we had we, some yeah. some technical difficulties. Yeah. Um, so we were in something like me explaining the prize pool percentage right wise. So yes. um, if you if you do the math, you find that the men get six point six seven percent, six and two thirds percent, six point six seven percent of the total revenue in prizes. Yeah. Um, the women get one third of the total revenue in prizes, thirty three percent. Yeah. Five times as much by percentage as the yeah. men do. Um, the men's champion gets 0.6% of the total revenue. The yeah. women's champion gets 4.4% of the total revenue. So, Sounds to me like the guys are getting shafted. Well, <laughs> the, I'm just appa- saying. Apparently, you're in a minority with that feeling. Apparently. Yeah. Um, so this really came to mind. Like This was brought to the fore, I think, a few months ago. Uh, a couple of the girls from the U.S. team were going around doing interviews, yeah. and they were complaining um, about this disparity and how much they're paid. Yeah. And there was at least one interviewer that was giving them some pushback about what they meant about equal pay. Yeah. Um, and uh, he said, so are you – I think it was a guy. Maybe it wasn't. That was the problem, obviously, <laughs> if it was a guy. Right. Um, but uh, he's, he said, well, uh, are you saying that you would like to work under the same contracts as the men? Yeah. Um, so the, but the men, they only get paid if they play, whereas the women's contract, they get paid whether they play or not. Really? Um, so they get less total money, but they get paid regardless. Yeah. Um, and it's the guaranteed men, money. Yeah, it's guaranteed money. And the men get paid more, but they only get paid if, they're, if they play. Yeah. And he said, uh, so if you, you want these things to be the same, are you saying that you would accept um, if you got more money that you would only get paid if you play? Yeah. Uh, just like the men. Yeah. And the response was, well, the realities of men's and women's <laughs> soccer are different. <laughs> All right. so, so, so the realities are different when it's in your favor. <laughs> right. We're yeah. equal if it would help me if we're equal, but we're yeah. different if it would help me if we're different. This yeah. is how a lot of these kinds of... Of debates arguments end up go, go yeah. um, whether it's uh, gender, race, or any other oppressed. Yeah, I say that in air quotes. Minority <laughs> in the yeah. U.S. I mean, there's certainly oppressed minorities, but yeah. um, it's not. Yeah. My point here, though, is that it's not the primary factor. I would say. Yeah. Like I'm not saying that there's no gender discrimination, but at least in the case of the women's soccer team, they're getting yeah. paid less because they generate less money. Yeah. Well, wouldn't the argument from the other side be that, well, maybe we need to take some of this money from the men's and redistribute it to the women's? That is an argument that they're making. And I think it's something that they're actually doing. I mean, I is think it really? That, yeah. I mean, FIFA's all yeah. one thing. And I, I suspect that the men's game is, is already subsidizing the women's game to some degree. I'm sure it is. Um, so, so FIFA is one. So they both are under FIFA's umbrella? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I didn't know. Yeah. So I don't follow soccer. Um, so that's the... And then, just as a side note, because I thought that this was funny. Um, I was watching France 24 the other morning, and uh, in the last week was World Oceans Day. I don't know ah. if you were aware. No, I was not. <laughs> yeah. World Oceans Day 2019. And the theme for World Oceans Day 2019 was <laughs> Oceans and Gender. <laughs> now... I was trying to figure out why <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or how this was related. Yeah, um, how you and, bridge those two? Yeah, I, I thought, like, I don't know, maybe they're trying to push STEM stuff. You know, they're always trying yeah. to push women into STEM yeah. um, these days. And I think it was purely political. Like, you know, we got to be on board with some kind of social justice cause. But, yeah. I, you know, and I thought, well, in most romance languages, and certainly in French, the ocean is a feminine noun. Okay. Right. Like so, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe, that's maybe there's a correlation here. There here? somehow. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the lady that was talking about it. She, while she's talking, they're showing a uh, video of you know dirty oceans with plastic forks and spoons and and paper plates and stuff flo- floating around in it. And I, I started to think, oh man, it, like is France twenty four about to tell me that if women would just stay in the kitchen and do the dishes, we wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> And that's that's not what they said. Is that not where it went? (laughs) That's not what they said. Um, Although they did It sounds like they insinuated it pretty hard, though. (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I don't don't know. We we need to quit using all this plastic. There's only one way. (laughs) Yeah, uh, they didn't explain um, the theme 
to yeah. me at any point. So I, it's still a mystery to me. <laughs> Interesting. Oceans and, and gender. Oceans and gender. And we should probably do a, a podcast on some of this gender stuff, but like the yeah. gender pay gap is a myth. I mean, it keeps coming up over and over it and over again. Up it a is lot. it is impossible to stop people from talking about this thing that has yeah. been disproven over and over and over again. I yeah. um so essentially what it comes down to is this. For those of you that don't know, you can check this out. It's it's easy enough to find this information. Where that number comes from. Yeah. Just just know where the number comes from and you know that there's a little bit of a problem if you know anything about comparative statistics, right? All right. Um what that number is, the you know, 79 cents on the dollar or whatever they say now. I think it used yeah. to be 76, now it's closer to 80 cents on the dollar, but yeah. um what that number comes from is that they took all income earned by men working full time and took the average and compared it with all income earned by women working full time. Okay. And took the average and they compared the averages. Yeah. Um, it didn't adjust for industry. Yeah. It didn't adjust. It didn't adjust for time worked. It just said really? full time. <laughs> so they're comparing, you know, people that are working eighty hours with people that are working thirty two or whatever full time yeah. thirty five. I forget what full time is considered these days. Forty but, hours full time. Is it forty? Still, well, I thought they dropped it back some. You can be considered full time at thirty two. Okay. Um, but I mean, to me, it's always been forty. I mean, if you're, but you know, I mean that, but I guess technically, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're you're still considered full time at thirty two. Yeah. So. Um. So anyway, it was it was all. Yeah. All income earned compared yeah. with all income earned without adjusting for anything. For anything, yeah. Anything at all. Um. So once other people got in there and started taking part these statistics and comparing apples to apples, yeah. In such a way, um, comparing experience, um, comparing education. Like none of this was taken into consideration in that first number. Well, I know some of the stuff I read said that, um, you have, I lost my train of thought. Um, but yeah, you have, well, men men and women work in different industries too. Mm -hmm. So like men generally work in fields that are more dangerous construction sites and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And, um, those fields tend to pay a little more than the office jobs and stuff, just things right. like that. Well, I, okay, just to correct the way you stated that, right. it's that um, dangerous fields tend to be populated almost exclusively by men. Well, yeah, they right. do. Yeah, Not necessarily that men work in more dangerous fields, Well, tend they, to work in more dangerous fields. It's that yeah. people that work in dangerous fields tend to be men. Yeah. Right. Overwhelmingly, from what well, yeah. I've read, yeah. Um, yeah. So you complain about the pay gap, but over ninety percent of workplace deaths are men. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, let's <laughs> exactly. let's see some equality there, <laughs> right? right? Um, but once they started adjusting for things that you should be adjusting for in the first place, once they yeah. started adjusting for education, time yeah. worked, experience, industry, well, and job, etc. Time, et time worked is a big one oh, because yeah. I mean, yeah, if you're not working the hours, you don't deserve the pay. Right. I mean, that's just. Basic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, once they got it down from that part, it, it fell within a standard deviation. It's a, yeah. essentially a nominal difference. It yeah. was like Close somewhere between 96 and 98 cents on the dollar or something like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, that can be explained through other things. Then you get into like the personality stuff. I don't know if you have ever listened to Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson does a... A little bit. He, he does an excellent job of expounding. I mean, he's a clinical psychologist. He's really... Um, done a, a lot, which with is the, the reason I like to listen to him. I like yeah. the psychology aspect of stuff like that. Yeah, um, he's done a lot of work with um, personality. Yeah, uh, like they spend a lot of time on that five point personality test. Yeah, um, and what he has said, essentially, it comes down to this: the things that, and, and this is probably true again across. Um, all of these kind of social justice complaints, whether you're talking about racism or sexism or what have you. Yeah. Uh, that it's not to discount that discrimination occurs. Yeah. It's to say that discrimination is not the only factor that results in these differences. Yeah. And um, in the the gender pay stuff, uh, it seems to come down in a lot of cases um, that there are some particular characteristics, personality characteristics that tend more towards men or women that affect your pay in the long run. Um, I was digging into... uh, uh, medical stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because the medical field is actually dominated by women. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, even at the at the highest levels, the doctors. Even, yeah. Um, men tend to get paid more than women. Yeah. Uh, the, so in the same specialty, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, it's not huge. Yeah. Um, once again. But, once but you there's a difference. For, yeah, it's, yeah. It's like between 5 and 10% depending on the field. Yeah. Um, and... But the when they get into the things that are less, that are more concrete in terms of you know what you're going to deal with on a day to day basis. So as professorships, when they were looking yeah. at medical school professorships, yeah. um, once they were comparing apples to apples, the women got paid on the average more than no. the men. And so, but this is something that I want to point out about the study because I couldn't find any good information in articles because they all have an agenda. Yeah. And so I went straight to the science. Yeah. Um, and what I found was, well, they seem to have an agenda too. Yeah. So just know also, like, pay attention to the way things are being framed for you. Yeah. And in this particular case, they, they were talking in generalities about how men were earning more than women uh, when they'd adjusted for experience and where they finished in their class and their field and, and so forth. Um, and then, but they weren't giving specifics. I mean, there's yeah. tables and stuff. Like I went through the the tables too. I, I like statistics. I, you know, I <laughs> yeah. Like, I like data actually. I'm, I enjoy data. <laughs> like I, crunching numbers. Yeah. Um, but the then you know they're talking about how well even there's still the wage gap even after you adjust for all these things. And once they'd adjusted for all these things, it was like five percent. Yeah. Um, you know, just five or six percent. It wasn't a huge difference. Uh, so then they speak specifically about um, going to all these medical schools and getting wage information on the professorships. These are MDs that are teaching, right? Yeah. Um, and once they'd adjusted for everything, uh, the women made more than the men. Yeah. Uh, hmm. And they gave you the numbers there. So the other yeah. things, they don't give you the numbers. They're just telling you how there's a wage gap <laughs> yeah. and it's uh, approximately this percentage difference yeah. and so forth. And then they speak talk about the specific case and they give you the actual average numbers once they had adjusted for location and you know all that yeah. other stuff um and the numbers were that the women got paid more than the men it wasn't a lot it was like yeah. a couple of percentage points yeah but in that case they but didn't it was say, there yeah but it was there and in this case instead of saying and in this particular case the women got paid more by x percentage yeah. they said the wages were comparable <laughs> comparable <laughs> yeah so it was comparable when the women got more yeah. but it was a wage gap when the women got less interesting and i just found that interesting i i yeah. didn't you know n not sure what entirely to make of it but yeah um it, it seems to be framed in such a way to make you think about it but in it, a there, specific way there's there's an agenda there so here's the other thing that i that i found and this relates to a lot of the that personality work um and the the thing about the personalities is that the the particular trait agreeableness yeah um it's like agreeableness on one side and um kind of antisocial on the other side so yeah. like if you're low in agreeableness then you're kind of a jerk and yeah. if you're high in agreeableness then you you know you want to give and help and what have you yeah um this is probably something that in a lot of cases draws people into the medical field. Yeah. Um, so there's going to be some level of agreeableness anyway. Although what you find when you dig into like what they do as specialties, you yeah. find that the women tend to um, work in specialties where they're in contact with patients all the time, yeah. and the men work in specialties that are technical. A lot yeah. of surgical specialties for the men, yeah. where it's just kind of mechanical, yeah. right? Um, and a lot of patient interaction with the women. And this yeah. is another one of those things that's, that's determined. And they're not huge differences. Like there's... A yeah. tremendous amount of overlap yeah. in in the averages on this, um, <laughs> but what it comes down to is that women tend to be more agreeable, um, less antisocial than men, and um, and men tend to be more interested in things, and women tend to be more interested in people. Yeah. And when I say tend to, it's like sixty forty. Yeah. Right. So if you took a random sampling of a hundred people yeah. that were, and it turned out that they were all interested in people. Yeah. Uh, there's a good chance that about 60 of them are going to be women and about 40 of them are going to be men. Yeah. Give or take. Yeah, that's fine. But when you're moving up in these specialized fields, right? Like yeah. when you start to get to the extremes, you, yeah. That that difference is exaggerated tremendously. Really? Right. Yeah. Um because the the outliers, yeah. like if you're thinking of the overlap, the outliers tend to be like 
for the higher end tend to be much farther along. Yeah. And so if you're looking for the best of the best, like hopefully you are with doctors, Yeah. Um, what you're finding is that people are self-selecting and competing more effectively in the things that they fall into more. So yeah. that surgical fields are like 80 or 90% men, yeah. um, whereas m- more like nursing fields are, are 80, 90% women. Yeah, because it's focused more on the people. Um, but here's the what I thought was interesting in terms of the of the pay gap here, and I've heard this other places as well. But I, I read articles by um, three different recruiters for medical field, like doctor recruiters. Yeah. And uh, they all said, and there was a theme here. They all said that they offer the same starting salaries to men and women. Yeah. That there's no difference in the starting salaries that they offer. Yeah. But that men are more likely to negotiate. Yeah. Than women when offered and that salary. Ask for that extra money. Yeah. So men tend to negotiate their salary up, whereas women tend to, and this is probably again like a 60 40, yeah. 70 30 kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and women tend to accept the first offer. Hmm. So they start at less money. Yeah. Not because they were offered any less, but because they accepted less. Yeah. Because they were more agreeable. Because, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, so the the point again is. <clears throat> not that that there is no such thing as discrimination. Yeah. It's that there are a lot of other factors in go- involved and that discrimination is probably not a major factor. Yeah. yeah. I would agree with that. I mean, I know in my experience, I don't see a lot of that type thing. I mean, you look for, in, in my experience, you look for the best, most qualified person mm-hmm. and it doesn't matter who that person is. Right. Um, and especially in my industry, at least, I mean, it's hard to find good people. Mm-hmm. It just is. Yeah. So, I mean, when you find them, it doesn't really matter who you who they are. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, you just you want good people. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. And I imagine it's that way in most businesses. I mean, I can only speak for the industry I'm in, mm-hmm. but I can't imagine in other industries that that you would discriminate somebody that that on paper looks like they're going to be that good employee Mm -hmm. and not hire them over something silly. Yeah. Well, and here's the other thing. Like we know that administrators tend to make more money. Yeah. uh, Right. And I can't say this for certain in the medical field, but I can compare it to education. I know something about, um, and, uh, and mom who was a public school teacher for a long time said the same thing. So the education field is dominated by women. Yeah. Just like it the is. medical field is yeah. dominated by women. Yeah. Um, but the people in positions of power tend to be men. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I, like I said, I, I think it probably is analogous. I can't say for sure. Yeah. But in the certainly in the education field, what mom said to me over and over again is that the men wanted those positions. Yeah. That the, and the they women, were striving to get there. Yeah. And they were moving towards it and they would accept it when it was offered to them. And that women like working with their students. Yeah. They, and here's they the preferred big difference. teaching right. over administrating. They wanted to be in the classroom. Yeah. They wanted to be in the classroom with the kids. I can and, see that. And I think that it's probably the same in um, medical administration where the higher yeah. positions are. Because once you move into administration, you're yeah. not dealing with patients anymore. Yeah. yeah. You're doing the other end. You're yeah. doing back end. Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, and just as a, a side note, because I found this really interesting. A um, couple of points when I was listening to some lectures on this stuff over the last couple of days. Um, that uh, the big difference in STEM fields, like it, a big part of it is that men self-select into these things and women self-select out of them yeah. um, because men are more interested in things. Yeah. So <laughs> engineering, <laughs> sciences, et cetera, tends to pull them in there. But here's the other thing, um, that there is good evidence that the intelligence graph the intelligence bell curve the distribution of intelligence yeah. um in women is tighter than men so okay. men the curve is more flattened out which yeah. means that when you get to the extremes of low intelligence yeah. it's more likely to be men yeah. and when you get to the extremes of high intelligence it's more likely to be men okay. um the I, I it seems that the prevailing theory is essentially that men tend to engage in more high risk high reward uh, yeah. type behaviors and that that may have something to do with it. Yeah. Um, but the, the other thing is that, uh, when th- women that are good at things, good at engineering, good at math, yeah. um, tend to not choose those as a career. But the other thing is that, 
um, men that are good at those things yeah. tend to not be good at anything else. <laughs> yeah. And the, the, so they're, if they're good at math, they don't have very good verbal skills. Yeah. But the women that are good at math tend to also have good verbal They've skills. They've got both sides. So yeah. they have options. Yeah. Like, so <laughs> men may go into these fields because it's the only thing that they're good at. Yeah. Whereas women choose things that they prefer to do more yeah. because they're good at all of it. Because they can, <laughs> yeah, they can swing both ways. Yeah. Um, so, uh, anyway, that, that's the point. I'm sure that we're going to talk about these kind of things more. I would actually oh, like yeah. to spend a lot of time on this because this, I think it's fascinating. Absolutely. Um, and you know, the, the point is that there's differences. Yeah. No, like, it's not a value judgment. Yeah. It doesn't mean that one's better than the other. Yeah. It's that they're different. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's undeniable. And yet somehow we're moving into a world where sexuality is biological, but gender isn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> How do you square that? Yeah. Anyway, that's all I've got for tonight. It, yeah, we're, I think we're over time a little bit, so I, I think that puts us at times. Yeah. So and there's not a whole lot there we can, like I say. I mean, we could talk about it, but a um, lot of unanswered questions still. Here's here's the short version. Iran didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, you can about bet the bank on that one. Yeah, Iran didn't do it. There's no advantage to them. Doesn't make sense. Um, so, uh, I guess, uh, until next time when we try to get this right, um, follow us on Facebook, uh, on iTunes, share, uh, would love to have some feedback. Absolutely. Um, again, Michael at the Liberty Mike.com. You can email me. I don't, I don't think we have such a huge listen- listenership that I can't keep up at this point. <laughs> Not yet. Um, I enjoy feedback. So, you know, thanks. Thanks to those of you who are providing it. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, share us, uh, like us, uh, please like us, um, <laughs> leave reviews, and uh, hopefully we can we can spread this message a little bit more. And um, we will see you guys again in about a week. Yeah, I think. Yeah, we need to. We're trying to do this as consistently as we can. Yeah. As explained at the beginning of this particular episode, sometimes life gets in the way. Yeah, man. things get in the way. So. Uh, if you want to, to have more consistency. Um, somebody is welcome to pay us to do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would happily take money to do this. Yeah. Um, until that happens though, I, I still have a job to work. As do I. Yeah. So, uh, again, um, uh, thanks for listening. Like and share. Um, is there anything else? Oh yeah. I have a website. I haven't written on there in a long time, but <laughs> I, I probably will again someday. I'll have um, to start pushing Mike into doing more writing. Yeah, um, we might have to follow the Scott Horton plan where I just give you the stuff that I can't seem to finish and you tell me how to finish it. <laughs> finish it for you. Yeah. Can At least tell that. me what to, what I need to, how I need to finish it. Yeah, how to round it out. Right. So um, until next time, uh, ciao. Later. <laughs>